What it do, what it do, guys. It's DeAnthony here, man, aka Hood Scout, back again for another edition of the Hood Scout Podcast. And this is really a unique podcast, a podcast like no other. We're going to have athletes, we're going to have coaches, we're going to have intellectuals, we're going to have media members of all sorts. And don't forget, guys, to like this podcast, share this podcast, and help grow this podcast. This is not just my podcast. This is also your podcast. And the only reason it's going to grow is because you guys are going to be invested in it, guys. Sit back, get your beverage of choice ready, get your popcorn ready, get your dinner ready, get your steak ready, get your vegan meal ready. Tune in, guys. Hood Scout. Peace. Hey, what it do, guys? Hood Scout back again for another edition of the Hood Scout podcast. Keeping up with this month, which is the end of February, still Black History Month. Um, I talked to a sister from low county area and that's the south carolina i don't know if you guys ever heard of the gullahs the gullah geechee community um but if you didn't sit back and listen to this one and you're probably gonna learn some probably gonna learn some some stuff that i didn't even know as it relates to the history of those within this country so sit back share this podcast like this podcast let's keep this momentum going take care guys and god bless peace Hey, what it do, guys? Hood Scout here, back again for another edition of the Hood Scout Podcast, where we're blending sports and education and history and all these type of things. And today I got a guest, a guest from the East Coast. And like we always do, without further ado, introduce yourself, tell the people who you are and where you're from. Hi, I'm Luana Graves Sellers. I am from Hilton Head, South Carolina, in the Low Country. And I have a website called Low Country Gala. So, and a lot of people don't, well, let me just speak for myself. I didn't know about the Gullah community and people until about, probably about two years ago. And believe it or not, my, my forefather is actually from North Carolina. And I think many African-Americans have their roots there as well. But talk to me about that growing up, where you from in that area and what was the culture like? Well, you know, um, basically I'm a lot like you growing up. I grew up in New York on Long Island and I had family in, in New York City. And so growing up, I had two aunts that would always kind of randomly say, I'm a Geechee, but they never told me what a Geechee was. And um, at one point I met someone who was a Gullah, but I didn't really know what that was either. So fast forward to just a few years ago, um, I have started doing a lot of genealogy research Mm. And um, it turns out, I mean, I moved to Hilton Head and I always knew that I had family in Ravenel, South Carolina, but not until I moved here about six years ago did I realize that my Ravenel family, Ravenel, South Carolina family are the Gullah connection that I have. And so between me moving to Hilton Head and learning some of the history and culture and everything that um, is, is um, everything Gullah, uh, that's kind of where Low Country Gullah came from because a lot of people don't realize, like you or, and me, that they are Gullah. And um, research has found that 89% of Black Americans who are descendants of slaves are Gullah. Wow. I know it's mind blowing. It's totally mind blowing. Oh, I, let me just stop you. I almost got emotional. And now this, I'm not being funny. Wow. I want you to repeat that again because that really hit me and, it, and I got a little choked up. Repeat that again. So anyone who is a black American in the United States that has their roots coming from enslavement in the United States 89% of those people are from the Gullah Geechee cu culture. And of that, 1% of them can attribute their, um, their beginnings in the United States to South Carolina. Wow. So it's, it's mind blowing. And, and to be honest, that's what fuels what I do. Because like you and like me, I didn't know. And I always grew up, uh, you know, I mean, do you call yourself African American? Do you call yourself Black American? Like, who am I? What am I? Mm -hmm. And so I didn't know, and and I always gravitated to Black American, 
not African American? Because I'm like, Africa where? Africa who? Mm -hmm. Like, mm -hmm. yeah. is there a tribe? Is there a right. country? I mean, mm -hmm. it's it's not a continent. It's a country and a you know. I couldn't identify it, so I just mm -hmm. stuck with black. But now, I can and you can say you're a Gullah Geechee American, which is is it's huge because. When I was in school, you know, and they had International Day and they would say, well, you know, um, I'm Italian American and I'm Chinese American and I'm Irish American or whatever, you know, black American is like, but that's just that's a color. It's mm -hmm. not a mm -hmm. it's not a culture. Mm -hmm. So now that I know that it's a culture, I want to share it with everybody. And so that's where Low Country Gullah came from. Man, this is going to be so fun. I know I got another interview out there. This one. No, I can just tell like the energy, the knowledge, and we're going to go so many different places with this. Let me ask you this. Being in New York, correct? Mm -hmm. What did you see as the big difference from New York and the low, 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 low country county area? Well, I mean, you're, you're talking north and south. So, you know, culturally, there's a huge difference between living up north and living in the south but you know going back to my both of my aunts who were always you know proudly saying i'm a geechee i grew up with red rice you know i grew up with okra i grew up with a lot of cultural gullah geechee cultural things mm -hmm. that they incorporated into my life and not until now did I realize that I had been living as a Gullah Geechee all of my life. I just wasn't calling myself that or identifying that way. So it's it's really, you know, one of those things, you know, like like say New Year's Eve, you know, when when you have Hop and John and cornbread for New Year's Day, mm -hmm. and, you know, your first meal of the day. All of that is Geechee. All of that is Gullah Geechee traditions. Um, you know, there, there are just so many that that are American and, and so many Gullah words like tote bag and jukebox. Those are Gullah words. Wow. You know, and and like one pot meals like shrimp and grits. That's Gullah. You know, um, one pot meals like a stew. That's mm -hmm. Gullah because they took what they had and they threw it in a pot and that was dinner. You know, so mm -hmm. so it. It's interesting that that most people in or most black people in America have been living the Gullah Geechee lifestyle and culture and really don't even know it. And, and you know what's so fascinating with that? It, it, you know, many of our many of us in these big cities like I'm in I'm in Dallas, Texas, mm -hmm. where many of our, our grandparents may have been from East Texas or Central Texas. And then, of course, before that, the Carolinas and they, they migrated through the wars and different things. But that older generation, the way that they cook, whether it be the stools, whether it be the okra, like my, my, my great aunt loved okra. Do you think it's, it's amazing how we still were connected, even though we were disconnected? Do you think we're we're we were losing those food pathways with the newer generation? Yes. And and basically what happened is. Um, after the Civil War, a lot of well, le let me back up just just so people have a better understanding of what, where Gullah Geechee, you know, mm -hmm. basically is. So the 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 U.S. government has federally designated from Jacksonville, Florida, to Jacksonville, North Carolina, as the Gullah Geechee Corridor. Mm -hmm. So from the coastline to 35 miles inland. That's the Gullah Geechee Corridor. Okay. Mm -hmm. So if you have anybody who lives within there that you can trace your roots back to, you're you're definitely Gullah Geechee. Mm -hmm. Not to say that they all had to stay there because after the Civil War, people scattered. You know, mm -hmm. they didn't want to stay in the South. A lot yep. went north, a lot went west. So mm -hmm. You know, you have a lot of people who just went wherever they went to. Mm -hmm. And to your point in your question, you know, a lot of things just kind of got watered down. You know, granted, there are some traditions that keep going, like the mm -hmm. okra and, you know, the red mm -hmm. rice and and just ways of cooking and things mm -hmm. like that. But, um, you know, a lot of things stay the same. 
And because they stay the same, you know, it's it's those traditions and cultures that that maintain themselves. Mm. You know, just like the watch night service, most mm. black churches, you know, come come Christmas, uh, not Christmas, New Year's Eve, mm -hmm. they do the the watch night service. Yep. Well, the history of the watch night service was that they were literally waiting or watching for word on New Year's Eve. Early, like during slavery, it was because on New Year's Day, a lot of um, slaveholders, they would sell off their family, the slaves, when starting in a new year. Like it was mm. a contractual thing. Wow. So that was the beginning of the watch night. And then when it came to emancip emancipation in 1865, it was the watch night that we're free. So, you know, it, it's, it's all part of this, the same thing. Um, but, but that's Gullah. That's, mm -hmm. that's one of the Gullah traditions that, that everybody's, you know, everybody does it now. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's common, commonplace and a lot of, um, you know, things that are, uh, sorry about that. No, you're fine. Go ahead. Um, a lot of things that, um, you know, are incorporated into, to black culture just like the black church and religion, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know, the, the church was where the Gullah received their information. It's where we receive our information today. Mm -hmm. You know, when is, when someone is running for a political office, the first place that they go, if mm -hmm. they're going into the black community is the black church, yep. because that's the, you know, the source of information. So, you know, there's just so many things that, that doesn't matter if you live in California, you know, that it, when you know what the culture is and some of the things that the culture, um, you know, traditions and things like that, then you, then you start putting those pieces together and it's like, mm -hmm. it's all there. Yeah. And you know, California is really one of those historic places that many of those people came from the South. So as a people, we've migrated so much, but we're, we're more similar and alike than we are not. Let, let, let's get into... What is, what is some of those Gullah traditions? What is some of those foods for the newer generation? And let me say this. I think for your generation, which is, you know, a little bit older than me, it is so important for you guys to do the work, whether it's writing the books, writing the documentaries. The only reason I know that my forefather came from North Carolina is because I had a relative who has since passed away recently, uh, wrote a book before, before she passed, she wrote a book on the family. And I don't know if a lot of, our family really understand the importance of that, but some of our, some of the younger generation, like myself, and I see others on social media, God has given us a hunger to know where, and, and, and I see it kind of rising back up. So your work is very valuable, but I want to, I want to, I want to kind of hit on some of those traditional foods and traditional ways of Gullah for the people who, who are listening for the first time and maybe never heard of it before. Well, what what was really interesting about the culture is it was really a simple way of life mm -hmm. and you know just to kind of back up a little bit more the reason why the gullah culture survived was because along the seacoast of the united states you had all of these sea islands and because a lot of them you couldn't get to with a car you know, the, the people who were living there, because a lot of the Confederates and the slave owners and all of that, they left, they literally left the, the um, you know, enslaved people behind. Mm -hmm. So they were able to maintain the culture. And so basically um, with the, the culture, they lived off the land and the sea. Mm -hmm. So most of the foods were fish, you know, fish-based foods. Um, and, uh, you know, a lot of vegetables, sweet potatoes, butter beans, um, you know, things like that. But the biggest one that, that I'll share with you is rice, mm. that every dish had rice in it mm -hmm. because the, the coastline, because it's really hot and marshy and swampy, you mm -hmm. know, it, along the sea islands, yes, it was where... Uh, the, the primary crop was rice. It wasn't cotton, 
yes, there was sea island cotton and indigo that was that was farmed, you know, by the the um, plantations, mm -hmm. but but rice was the primary um, um, crop, and mm -hmm. it was the number one crop in the United States at one point. Not cotton, you know, mm -hmm. it was it was rice, and it was it was it became the number one crop based on the backs of the enslaved people that were stolen from West Africa because the, the people who were here in, in the United States, they had the seed, but they couldn't figure out how to work it. So mm -hmm. what they did was they went to West Africa and got the um, Africans who were knowledgeable and very successful in growing rice. Mm -hmm. and they brought them here. And so along the, the coastline, because it's swampy, it, because you have the, the ocean, which is the salt water, and then you have freshwater lakes and ponds and things like that, that's why rice really, really thrived here. Mm -hmm. And so um, basically, the, that's why rice was such a staple. And, and I'll, I'll just throw this in and um, just so that you know, the 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 waterways and it's called the water trunk systems that were created in order to hold back the salt water and let the rice develop in the fresh water was so incredible in its technology that it is told that that the um the power of them is the had the strength of the Hoover Dam and the technology of it was equivalent to the uh, Egyptian pyramids. So that's the kind of stuff yeah. that they, you know, brought to America. And, and from there, the crop just thrived and, you know, made a lot, a lot of people wealthy. Matter of fact, um, if you've ever had Carolina rice, mm -hmm. that was the, the seedling was called Carolina gold. Um, and there was one plantation owner, he made so much money, he named it gold mm -hmm. after, you know, because it, it was his gold, so to speak. Yeah. But rice is, is probably the biggest um, um, food that, that you would be um, familiar with. Yeah. And, you know, it's fascinating when you're talking about whether it's sweet potatoes or candy yams or a lot of these foods, we, we still, even though we lost some of it, we still eat without knowing that history. And it is my belief that if the youth can understand the history, I, I, I think that will swell in us a righteous pride that 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 because when you don't know it, you kind of discombobulate a little bit. And I'm going to tell you a funny thing. Um, I, I, I want to take up fishing recently. I'm, we're in these cities, man. We're so city five where we don't do a lot of those things they did in the quote unquote country. But I told my cousin yesterday or something fascinating. When we was on the fishing aisle at Walmart, we would see African-American men come in time and time again. And they were so knowledgeable about fishing. You know, me and my cousin in our 20s, well, we're 30 now, but we, we were kind of like, hey, what did we do with this? And how do we catch this? Those guys knew this stuff like the back of their head. And what it told me was we, we need to start telling the youth some of this stuff because yes. the elders know it. Like that, that's that's like an ingrained crap. I asked one guy, so you're a fisherman? He said, man, I'm out there anytime I get from the creek to the this, that. And, and you look at them, if you look at them, you would judge him and say, he don't know what he's talking about, but he told us what we need to fish, what type of rod we need, what we want to catch, what type of bait is. And I know that that originated from those areas, yes. you know, and that, that it, it was so powerful for me because I don't think that stereotype is out there, but our men are fishermen. They knowledge about these things. And I just think it's so important. Do you think that's important for the youth to understand that power of that? History? Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and just so that, you know, when, um, you know, traditionally you were talking about, you know, rod and a reel in, in fishing, the traditional way of fishing, uh, that was, was used is called a cast net. Mm. So they would take a huge net that, that, and part of the culture was, is that, um, someone, you know, usually the men were weaving those nets and they would stand on the boat and throw the net and then, you know, pull it back in. And that was the catch. Or they would go shrimping or crabbing, you know, um, in the waters. 
but absolutely, you know, it's, it's important for everybody to be able to, to not only know about things like that, you know, so that they know what the history and the culture is and, and, you know, where, where it all comes from, you know, it's nothing is random. Mm -hmm. Nothing is random. You know, everything came from somewhere and, and that way of fishing, you know, all of that is African tradition. It is. You know, it's, it's, it's all in the African tradition. Um, you know, just, just, it's just a question of where in Africa, you know, mm -hmm. and, and of the different countries, there were probably about seven to 10 on the West coast of Africa. So, you know, the, the largest, the largest amount of people came from Angola, uh -huh. um, you know, which, which some people say is, is how the word Gullah came about, you mm -hmm. know, it's like a derivative and mm -hmm. there was a Gola tribe in, in um, West Africa as well. So, I mean, that's where it comes from, but it's all connected. It's all connected. You know, it's just a question of how and what and, you know, and where. Mm -hmm. So you say you you got this 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 thing to really understand about the Gullahs. Did you say about six years ago, seven years ago, or was it longer than that? Okay. That's it. What what was what was the mindset? What was the spiritual oomph that made you want to do that? And and then walk me through that process. Well, you know what, it is it's really one of those God stories mm -hmm. because um, I didn't plan to do this at all. Um, I was really looking for something to do. Um, mm -hmm. my mother had just retired. Um, I had a death in the family. And so I decided to stay with my mother and, you know, so I wasn't planning to move to Hilton had nothing, none of that. Okay. And so I was looking for something to do while I was here with her. And I just happened to be in the car with her one day and, uh, we were passing a magazine uh, you know, and a local, local magazine. And so I said, you know, let's pull in and let's see, you know, I have a sales background. So I'm like, maybe I, I could sell the magazine. Cause you know, I've been in advertising for a long time. And so they're like, well, we don't need anybody to, to sell the magazine, but we could use, um, always some freelance writers. Now, mind you, I have a degree in journalism and black history. Um, but I hated writing. Okay. <laughs> as a child. And, you know, I mean, I didn't like the technical aspect of it. So, but I said, you know what, what are you doing for black history month? And then, mm -hmm. and this was like a, in November and they said, well, we haven't even thought about it. So let me do it. Just I'll do it. Mm -hmm. They didn't know me. They didn't know if I could write, I could have written the cat is in the yeah. hat. It's yeah. black and it's fat. Mm -hmm. you know. So anyway, um, so I started doing the research and whatnot and I wrote six articles wow. and uh, 8,500 words later, I had not only the largest section of the magazine, but they, they made the, the focus of the magazine, the Gullah culture and put it on the cover. Wow. And it turned out that it was the largest selling um, edition that they had ever had and had actually gone into reprint because people started hoarding the magazine and shipping it to their friends and family everywhere, like wow. around the country and even, even around the world. And so after that, they were like, okay, what else can you do? So I was like, wow. so um, I started writing every month. I, and, and the first column that I had, in addition to just keep writing, you know, general stories and traditions and things like that, I started writing about the first families of Hilton Head and literally taking the, the history from the original like patriarch in the family line from them all the way to current people who are living on the island and, you know, doing that history and tracing it back. And that became like a really popular, you know, um, column for them. Mm -hmm. And so I wrote about 15 of those. And I mean, since then I've just been writing, you know, I, and, and every day, you know, people had been asking me, where can I get this article? Where can I get that? And so instead of sending it to the magazine's website, I said, 
I might as well start my own website. So I did. And that's where Low Country Gullah came in. And I've been writing ever since. And, you know, when I got that aha moment for me, mm-hmm. when I was just like, wow, I have a history and a culture and a people and, and I can trace my roots. You know, I may not know the specific tribe or place in Africa where I can go, mm-hmm. but I know that that my great, great, great grandfather, uh, my grandmother's great, great grandfather, that he was in Charleston and escaped, made his way to Buford, joined the U.S. colored troops, the Union Army during the Civil War, and he was in Hilton Head. And again, so now I'm walking on the ground that he walked on, mm-hmm. you know, and and so it's things like that. And, and I have to tell you this because it's another mind blowing thing that that Hilton Head not only was the Union Army here, but and because they were here, enslaved people from everywhere. It was like a Mecca. You know, mm-hmm. I know the army's there. I can be free. I'm on my way kind of thing. And so because of that, they didn't know what to do with tens of thousands of slaves who were willing to just sit down and say, I'm safe, you mm-hmm. know, I'm free. So what happened was there, one of the generals said, you know, there was a lot of chaos and he said, you know what? It would be really funny if we gave all of these formerly enslaved people, and this is before the Emancipation Proclamation, mm-hmm. the, a plantation that was, you know, where enslaved people worked and gave them their own town. So it's called Mitchellville. And so it was, it was a complete town. It had its own government. It had its own tax structure. Mm -hmm. It had its own schools and a hospital and retail stores. And it was the first place for compulsory education in South Carolina. And um, in order to get in the town, if you were not black, you needed a pass. I mean, they were totally. Oh, wow. Uh, this, is be- this is 1862, mm-hmm. three years before emancipation. And the just to protect the town, the general had a fort, Fort Howell, built at the head of the town to protect it in case the Confederates decided to come in and raid it or whatever. Mm -hmm. So, you know, even if you can't go to Africa or whatever, so many people were in Mitchellville. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. People were in the Gullah Geechee corridor that you, it it, it grounds you. It just, it gives you, it gives you roots. It gives you roots that you may never have had or may never have thought that you could have had. Mm -hmm. And it's, mind-blowing it, it, it's amazing because we haven't spoke a lot before this but i know for sure that my forefather fought in the war and i think it, it was it, i'm not sure the, the exact history of it, but it was i think from north carolina to tennessee mm-hmm. and you know they obviously migrated to texas but that they they were he was literally in that area in that wartime that you're speaking of so that kind of speaks to the truth of what you're saying i want you to give people your website uh your website again and I want to, I want to, I want to continue this. What I want to talk about, um, do you know, was it very common to have many African-American towns at that time, like throughout that area? Oh, no. it wasn't. Okay. No, because, because, because this was before emancipation, mm-hmm. essentially black people, they didn't have a um, legal standing. Okay. They weren't, you know, they're the whole three fifths of a man and all of mm-hmm. that. So during the war, they were called contraband because mm-hmm. essentially someone else owned them, you know, owned the 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 um, enslaved person, and the Union Army had them. So mm-hmm. technically, just like something you would kind of steal or something of somebody else's, they called them contraband. So there weren't a lot of towns like that. Mitchellville was the first. Mm -hmm. There were others eventually, you know, after, you know, 1865 and, you know, years, years after that. But 
but um, this one was the first where, you know, they did everything. It, it, they were completely self-governed and um, were able to, to um, kind of do their own thing. And, and it was really a test that um, the Lincoln and the government wanted to give to even see if they could be self-sufficient. You know, and and so, um, you know, when a lot of northern and, and I'm sure you've heard, you know, a lot of northerners came down and were educating and whatnot. That's where they were coming to. They were coming to the south because the Union Army was here and they started that process. Um, and it, it, it's all it's all part of a time called um, the Port Royal experiment, because the Hilton Head area is is called Port Royal, um, wow. you know, the area. So it's the Port Royal experiment. So there are a lot of things that came out of there that you may have heard of. 40 acres and a mule. Yep. That was a Port Royal experiment. Wow. The Freedmen's Bank, uh, the Freedmen's yeah. Bank Bureau. Mm -hmm. yeah, I do. That was a Port Royal experiment. Wow. Mitchellville. You know, all of those kind of things were were part of. Let's see, you know, if they can do, you know, what they can and and be self sufficient and take care of themselves, given the opportunity. You know, a lot of it failed, um, like the Freedmen's Bureau, that fell apart, you know, years mm -hmm. after a lot of um, Black people lost their money. Yeah. Um, you know, the 40 acres in a, in a mule, you know, they said that there was a point where some people did get 40 acres and the mule was like the leftover Union Army stuff. But when Lincoln was assassinated, they pulled it all back and took the land back. So nobody got their 40 acres in a mule. So, you know, but but at least during Lincoln, it was it was an opportunity and a chance for um, reconstruction. And 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 that was the whole reconstruction time, you know, or, or part of the reconstruction plan. And, you know, if if things had had continued and and were um able to finish based on the plan, who knows how black Americans, you know, would be to doing today mm -hmm. based on, you know, some of the things that, that they thought of, but that's a whole nother conversation. Do, for do, do you think that after they seen that, that, that city prosper or do well on their own, that, that made them afraid of what could be? No, not, not at the time. The reason why Mitchellville did not survive, and it only lasted for about five or six years, but the reason why it didn't was because the the military was here. And so when the town was established, each family was given um, land and they were given the supplies to build a house. And so they could farm, you know, their their own crops and whatever, and they could sell whatever talents they had. So if someone was a seamstress or, you know, fisherman or growing crops, whatever, they they could sell it. But they were selling it to the Union Army. Mm. When the war was over, the Union wow. Army left. And so, you know, the the prosperity that Mitchellville had essentially left. Um People stayed on the island, but instead of staying in Mitchellville, they just kind of scattered around the island. They stayed, but you know, it it just didn't last. So it wasn't it wasn't some other reason. I mean, there are a lot of reasons behind it, but primarily that's what happened. You know, the army left, and so the cash cow left too. Wow, that, that's a nugget. I mean, just just learning that kind of tells you why. Like because it was money was flowing in that wow that's very interesting let's talk a little bit again about that history like what i i, I read about the basket making and, and different things like that talk let's talk about that history again and some of that culture what are some of those cultural nuances of that area you know whether it's basket making or something else that maybe people don't know about well you know it's interesting um today if you wanted a sweet grass basket um you could get one for a hundred dollars, three hundred dollars. You know, I mean, it's it's a beautiful piece of art as mm -hmm. we see it today. Mm -hmm. But back then, it was functional. It was what they used to sift rice. You mm -hmm. know, a, a big basket, basket kind of like a like a wok shaped. Mm -hmm. You know, that's what they used to sift the rice. 
Um, you know, it was functional. It was a part of living. And so, you know, talents to be able to make baskets, it's one of those traditions that um, hasn't been handed down. Um, you know, just like the, the, the net making for the, for the fishermen, you know, it, it's a real talent. Mm -hmm. um, you know, when the, the, the men would, and let me, let me back up for a second, because the roles were really traditional. The men fished, the women took care of the house and, um, you know, and the children. Sometimes the women would help, you know, with the, the crops and things like that. But, but it was really just cut and dry. You know, the men did their thing, the women did their thing. So, you know, the, the skills, most net making was done by men. Basket weaving was, was done by men. The, the quilt making, that was something that was done by the women. Okay. And let me tell you something a little bit about the quilt making. It wasn't, the quilts were not just a blanket to keep you warm. During enslavement, what they did was those quilts were made from old clothes, you know, ripped clothes or whatever, but they were telling a story. So some of the quilts were either telling or remembering life in Africa mm -hmm. to treasure it for you know future generations, or they were ways of figuring out how to run away. You know, like if, if you're going to the water, like you know, each block could be woods to the water to the river. You know, I mean, it, it was coded information. So it wasn't just a random, let's throw some fabric together. They all had a real meaning behind them. And, um, you know, some of them were made specifically, like if someone was a midwife, you know, and they were, um, you know, delivering babies or, or the local um, herbalist who was, you know, helping with, with um, medicine and things like that. Sometimes they were specific to, you know, to those things, but for the most part, they they were informational. Mm -hmm. So there's there's a lot. There's there's so so much. Yeah, and and is it okay if you give your website once again for people to? Oh, absolutely. Want to, yeah, what's that website again? Absolutely, the website is lowcountrygulla.com, and um, I'm also on social media. You can find me Twitter, YouTube, um, Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn. Um, so I'm always posting information, um, stories and articles and things like that. Um, before we got on here, um, I am finishing up my third documentary. Mm -hmm. uh, this one is on Harriet Tubman from the railroad to a spy. Uh, so that story, because Harriet Tubman was on Hilton Head at one point, mm -hmm. and uh, she was one of the first, well, not one of, she was the first black woman to um, be involved with the Union Army and help strategize and plan a military operation. So that's what that documentary is on. And so I have a lot of documentaries and even video shorts on YouTube, which is also under Low Country Gullah. Everything is Low Country Gullah, you know, social media wise. Um, but if you go on YouTube, I do one on the story of rice so that you can see, you know, the history of rice and how important it was to the culture. I did one on um, the, the quilts, you know, so there, um, slave Bible, you you name it. There's there's a whole bunch of stuff. Um, and, and there's even one on, on um, Juneteenth and there's another one on Mitchellville. So, you know, if you wanna do a deeper dive into Mitchellville and Juneteenth and all of that, you know, I definitely have the documentaries. So you could check out the YouTube channel there. I just want to make sure I throw that out for people who are listening and want to get more information. Yeah, I you, know, that. you know, one fascinating thing with, and I, I want to go a little bit longer, and, mm -hmm. but I'm also mindful of your time. The thing with the quilts that's fascinating is I remember from my great grandparents' generation, the teaching of making quilts, and some of them will be different colors and different tech, different patterns. That's fascinating that realistically that came from there. 
were the women into making clothes and was that a normal type of thing as well? Yes. Yes. Just yeah, I, I think like, did you mute yourself? No, I didn't. You, you can't hear me? Okay, you back. I got you. I'm sorry. Okay. Yeah. Um yes, the an the answer to that is yes. You know, just like today, you know, if someone is a carpenter or if someone is a seamstress, you know, if that's what you're good at, that's what you did. Mm -hmm. um, and so, yes, their clothes, the quilts, you know, the quilting was the, the, the time of day where, say, the women could get together and talk and share and, you know, that kind of thing. So, so yes, if, if there was someone who was good at making clothes, mm -hmm. they were the one who made the clothes for everybody. And, you know, the, the nice thing about the culture is, is that not only is, is it a face-to-face -face culture in that a lot of things aren't written down. So it was the elders talking to, you know, sharing those stories, just like we do now. Mm -hmm. But the culture was also, if I had, you had. You know, whatever I had, you had. So if, if I grew crops and you fished, you give me fish, I give you crops. You know, if I made clothes and you built boats, you know, whatever it was. And they, they just shared. They just shared and provided for each other and, and really took care of each other. And, and that was the, the, the way of Gullah life, mm -hmm. you know, that, um, you know, you give to, to get and, you know, it, it's a beautiful thing. It's, it's a beautiful thing because it was really the, the, the structure of African village. That is exactly how Gullah life was. And, and even on Hilton Head today, there is, um, you know, the Gullah elders are part of the leadership and, you know, there are leaders who, who kind of come together and, um, and discuss things in, in support and uh, betterment of the, of the community. So that's still going on right now. Mm -hmm. So, you know, a lot of those traditions, even though, you know, it may have been spread out and watered down or whatever, it's still going on today. And I, I think the power with that is, to be honest, I don't know many women younger women my age and i know there are some so you don't want to make a broad statement but i don't know how many are into making quilts and sewing i, I really feel even in dallas dallas has a, a deep african-american history going back to the 1900s to what the 1950s and then i mean historic black communities hamilton park stuff like that and it started to deteriorate whether they built lakes and different highways really messed up a lot of neighborhoods um I almost forgot what I was about to say, but I was going to say what is it, it's kind of hurtful that some of this, some of the disconnect has started. How do you think we can, my generation can kind of bridge it together in a way? In a word, ask. Okay. Right now, a lot of the elders, they're dying off. Ah, uh, Yeah. And, and, you know, for me, there's so many questions. My, my grandmother is still alive. She that's just turned 97. So I've been bugging her. Yeah, yeah, no, that's <laughs> great. Tell me, tell me, yeah. tell me, tell me, tell me. Yeah. you know, as much as I can. But that's what you have to do. And if I knew what I know now, 10, 20 years ago, I would have started, you know, tell me, tell me. Because, you know, years ago i mean my grandmother understands now the importance of it to me but before it was just like yeah you know yeah. i don't need to tell you whatever yeah. Yeah, yeah you know i had my life i lived my life and you know that kind of thing mm -hmm. but you really have to push for it yeah. and see gullah culture is a face-to-face -face culture so if you don't take that time and and one of the things that is prevalent with the elders and I'm sure you grew up with this because it's it's definitely a black thing, you know. When the the adults are speaking, children be quiet. Yep. That's Gullah, you know. It's it's called um, little pigeon big ears, you know. That that they're listening, but you know, it's the information isn't shared. So you know, as as young people, 
you, you got if, if you don't ask, you will never know. And mm -hmm. if the information dies, it just dies. And and one of the things that that truly hurts my heart is that the Gullah language is something that is it's going away. Wow. You know, and and Gullah culture is one of only a few indigenous cultures in mm -hmm. America. Think about that. Yeah, that's that's deep. Yeah. That's deep. Yep. Wow. You know, I mean, you're talking about the Indians, you're talking mm -hmm. about the Gullah. I don't think not as far as I'm know, I don't think there's anybody else. Mm -hmm. So so the language and the culture it's our job to keep it going. It's our job to learn. It's our job to know. And I mean, it's a beautiful thing to make that connection, but soak it all in and share it, share it, share it, share it. That's why I do what I do because, you know, with the Gullah language, when, um, you know, at least a lot of the people who, who speak it or have spoken it, they stopped speaking it because they were told they sounded ignorant yeah. or backwards. And so, you know, and, and they were made to seem that they should be ashamed of speaking that way. That's not the case. You know, just like Gullah, if you've ever heard it spoken, sounds just like the Jamaican Patois. Yeah. So, you know, they're very similar because they're both Creole based languages. But if, if no one speaks it, it's gone. And True. if it's gone, then, you know, what do we have? Mm -hmm. What do we have? You know, so, so it's, it's important. You got to ask, you got to ask, you got to know, and, and you can't assume, please don't assume that they're going to teach it to you in school. Because I have a degree in black history. I never heard of Mitchellville, you yeah. know, Harriet Tubman and the Combi River Raid, you know, Three and 750 people, never heard of it. That's why I'm doing that documentary because it was stuff that I learned and I'm like, it, most people probably don't. So you, you, you have to push yourself and, and, um, and uh, gather up as much as you can and then share it with somebody. All righty. Guys, you're tuning to the Hood Scout Podcast. We're 45 minutes in. Um, well, in, in shortly, I got a few more questions. So, you know, I don't want to be with long. Right with, but, okay, okay. So, we're, we're, we're going to go close by, probably, probably close to an hour. That's fine. I want to say this two, two points, but just I want first, you, you mentioned school twice. What uh, college did you go to? Southern Illinois University in Carbondale. Okay, great. I want to ask you what were the careers of the men like what were what were the the crap what were the skill of the men what were the men known for we talked about fishing but was it any other skills that they were primarily known for absolutely absolutely i mean primarily it was fishing and farming okay you know th those were the the two big ones but you had um blacksmiths you had iron workers you had um bateau makers and a bateau is the kind of boat that they use to go fishing in. So, you know, you had skilled people who, or skilled men who were making bateaus. Um, so, you know, whatever the needs were, you know, if it was a wagon wheel or building a house mm -hmm. and, you know, when, when just, just when someone needed, let's say anything, a boat, a house or whatever, the community would come together, they'd build a house. Wow. You know, if, if you knew how to um, put the structure together and you knew how to build the door and you knew how to, you know, get the windows, that everything was interconnected so that they were always helping each other um, do what was necessary. So you name it. And, and the thing is, is that the, the, people who were captured in West Africa, they came with skills. You know, they were literally the best of the best. Mm. They were specifically targeted for what they could do. You know, if they could make brick, if they could, you know, um, do the, the trunk works for rice, you know, they were very specific. Um, you know, one of the things that that is really interesting is that 
when it came to to rice harvesting, mm-hmm. that was the women's job. That was primarily left to to women um, because it's. I mean, it's it's backbreaking work. You know, you have to. I don't know if you've ever seen a rice um, plant, but it's like long and kind of looks like if you ever see if you ever see grass that grows really tall and then it gets uh-huh. the seeds on top, uh-huh. kind of looks like that. Okay. You know, like the yep. top of it. Mm-hmm. So they would have to take something and and cut the 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 bottom off, and then but all of those little seeds that were at the top, they would have to separate it. So they were mm-hmm. like you know, pounding it and sifting mm-hmm. it to get the the seed out of the hull, you know, that kind of thing. So it, it all depend on, depended on what your skill set was. But again, it was a village. So, you know, whatever, who had what, we all just came together and, you know, did what was necessary. And, and you know, you talk about kind of like how frustrating it is, but the next generation things getting lost. I, I believe in my heart, we're going to, the youth are going to come back to that old style. I, I, I believe that it's going to be a rebirth. I really do. I think um, it's be happening. Yeah, 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 I do. I do. I really believe yeah. that. Um, let's talk about that documentary. How, 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 when did that first come to your mind and how was it making it? What was that process like making your documentary? Which one? <laughs> the, the, the latest one. The latest one. I'm sorry. The, the current one? Yes, ma'am. Okay. So, so um, first of all, Harriet Tubman is my shero. Okay. You know, I, I think that she, um, first of all, I'm a Marvel fan. So okay. that's how I think okay. she could have been one of the Marvel, okay. you know, characters. Mm-hmm. Um, that's how cool she is as a person. And um, because I knew some of the things that she had done, you know, everybody knows about the railroad, but that's about it. You know, she was instrumental in getting the um, the enslaved men into the U.S. colored troops. It was because of her and Frederick Doug- Douglass and a few other people who literally went to Lincoln and said, you know, we could do this. Mm-hmm. You know, you need people. There's a millions of black people, you know, who are ready to, to help you. So there were just so many things. And when the movie Harriet Tubman came out, I don't know if you saw it or not. Um, I guess it was two or three years ago, maybe four or whatever. But um, when it came out, I was really excited about seeing it because I'm like, mm-hmm. finally, someone's doing something big on the screen and, you know, the story is going to be told. Mm-hmm. And I was so disappointed. Wow. And, and let me stop you. I, the reason I didn't see it because I've heard, so I heard different pushback. I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, no, no. You're fine. So when I saw it, it, it pissed me off so yeah. much that I wrote two reviews on it. And then I thought about it and I thought about it. And, you know, this is the third documentary. And, and I said, you know what, if I'm going to tell a story, I need to tell Harriet's story. And so, yes, I talk about, you know, she, where she was born. Yes. I mentioned the railroad and, you know, some of the things that she did, but I go into the stuff that most people don't know about. You know, and I don't want to spoil it for you. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah okay. you know, but but it, it's it's kind of like mind blowing what she did, how she lived, the the contributions that she gave to not only the Union Army but to mm-hmm. America. Mm-hmm. I had to. It it was it was like <laughs> you yeah. know, I I just I had just had to get it out there. So you know, to me, it's it's. Um, um, you know, one of those must do's that it, it was just in the making. Mm-hmm. So, you know, you'll, you'll have to watch it and let me know what you think after, after you see it. Um, it is premiering this Friday on the Island on Hilton head, but next week, starting on the 28th, I'm going to upload it to YouTube. So anybody who wants to watch it from next week on, you know, it'll, it'll be on the low country Gullah, uh, YouTube channel. Just, I'm, I'm- to, you know, just search um, Harriet Tubman in the channel. I'm going to be sure to, to subscribe to your channel. Um, is there any museums or things within that area that teach about the Gullah history, whether it's in the South Carolina or the Carolina area? Any any museums that kind of would help with that? There are several. Um, on Hilton Head, there's a Gullah Museum. Um, in Georgetown, South Carolina, where uh, the rice culture was king. Let's mm-hmm. call it. 
there's a Gullah Museum there. Um, there is Mitchellville. Um, Mitchellville is actually a park now, and they have been digging and finding artifacts. Uh, so they're they're still in the process of trying to to put everything together. But within the next few years, it's going to be you know something huge. Um, and also in Charleston, there's a new museum. It's the International uh, International African American Museum. Wow. That's coming this year. And that is in Charleston on the location of Gadsden's Wharf, where the, the slave ships actually docked. So it's literally on the, the location where ancestors not only walked, but they were sold. So it's going to be a really powerful, powerful, powerful place to go. Um, so if you're ever in, you know, um, in the Charleston area, definitely, um, you know, those, those four are, are definitely um, places to see. And there's another one in, in Pinpoint Museum in that's uh, just outside of Savannah. Um, and that's, you know, another Gullah uh, museum. Wow, good, good information. Do we're going to end on these two questions, I believe. Sure. Do um, is the diet of the Gullah people in that area still traditionally the same, or has it changed a little bit? And if it if it is the same, what, what is the diet? I know, I know a lot of food, a lot of seafood, but talk, I want to hit, tell you to hit on that one more time about that diet, what they eat, what they ate, and things of that nature. Well, Gullah food is really southern cooking. Okay. So if you eat southern food. That's Gullah food. Okay. So, you know, the, the greens, the lima beans, you know, red rice, white rice, um, you know, chitlins, pig feet. Oh, wow. I didn't know that. Yes. Wow. I didn't, that's, see, I didn't know that. I didn't think they ate a lot. I, I thought it was a lot, of, a lot of fish and soup and shrimp and things. I didn't know they ate a lot of pig feet and stuff like that as well. There. I mean, it, yes, be, the, there's a lot more seafood because they were on the water. It was easy mm -hmm. to get, but that's not all they ate. Okay. So, you know, they ate what they were given. And so um, it, it is a combination. One thing I will tell you that was different um, about the, the Gullah is that on the coast, they were able to work under what is called a task system of slavery, which meant that if you um, let's let's say your your job was to to um, field rice, you know, so if you were able to do your work from say seven o'clock in the morning till five o'clock in the afternoon or whenever you finished whatever your requirements were, you had the rest of the day to do what you wanted. Hmm. So they were able to fish for themselves. They were able to, you know, do for themselves. That's part of the reason why when the armies left, they already, they were living, you know, hmm. they were doing their thing. In other areas like, um, you know, of the South, further West, mm -hmm. it was a, it was more of a chattel system, which meant sun up, sun down, you're out there in the field picking cotton, you know, I don't care, just keep going until I tell you to stop. Mm -hmm. So that's what was really different about the Gullah is that they were able to hold on to the traditions and the, the ways that they were familiar because they all came from different West African countries, but since they were able to, to blend into not only a language, but, you know, maintain those, those cultures and traditions. And so that's why, you know, it's a lot of it is African based because they had that freedom to, to do that. Mm -hmm. Man, it's amazing. Like the food, like we, we, you think, oh, this is just the South, Arkansas, just Mississippi, just Texas. No, that food came right from there, and a lot of us still eat it today. Oh, wow! Have you ever man. seen High on the Hog? I did, I didn't, but I, I've heard a lot about that it. one. I've yeah. heard a lot about that one. Yeah. Wow. It man. it breaks it down, you know, like the sweet potato, the yam, the okra, you know, and and it literally 
it does come to Hilton Head and talks, you know, like really goes into the African food, then the 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 Gullah food, like all the way through to to modern day like barbecue. But all of that, all of that, you know, it's 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 so well done, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's a, that's that's very that's a very acclaimed a documentary, very acclaimed. Let's end on these two ones. We're hour in, so let's get ready in. Sure. Uh, give give give. What advice or what thing would you would you tell the my generation, younger generation, and, and your generation? Like, what's some parting wisdom from a historical perspective that we can have going forward? Well, I guess on for I mean I, I mentioned before, you know, push yourself, push yourself to know, learn who you are. It's really empowering to to know who you are and what you can connect to. So that would be the first thing. The second thing that I would say is, you know, Gullah culture was one where we were together. You know, we relied on each other. And if we could get back to that, yes. who knows what we could accomplish? Yes. You know, so when you see somebody say something, just don't walk by them say, Hey, how you doing? You know, you don't have to have a 20 minute conversation, but you know, just connect like that. We, we need to love each other more versus hating on each other. Yeah. So, I mean, those would be my two, you know, and, now, and, and, yeah, and, <laughs> yo, and, that, and that's so powerful. I was just talking to a head coach out of uh, New Orleans, which you know, that's kind of a historic area, if you will. And he was saying traditionally in that tradition, you spoke. And in fact, if you did speak, you know, it's kind of like, what's wrong with you? And, you know, right. so that all that come from there, though, it's, it's all the same. So, exactly. wow. Just just like, you know, I'm sure when you grew up that that when you went out, if, if one of your mother's friends saw you doing something, they'd say, you know, hey, I know who you are. I'm going to go tell your mother. You yeah. know, we took care of our kids that way, you know, and, and that's Gullah. That's purely Gullah. So, you know, we need to get back to that. You know, if if I see your child acting up, I say something, you know, or in danger or something. But, you know, everybody doesn't do that. And, and we should, because if we don't take care of each other, who's going to take care of us? Yeah, it truly takes a village. Wow. Well, that, that's it, guys. I, I, I'm thankful that you joined me. I'll be sure to send you a link when we edit this one and get this podcast ready to go. Uh, much success on your documentaries, on e you. everything that you put your mind and your talents to. I pray that it prosper and uh, enjoy your rest of the day. And thank you so much uh, for joining me. You're welcome. I, I really enjoyed it. And, and uh, you know, if, if you want me to go into a deeper dive some other time, yeah, just we, let we, me know. Yeah, yeah. We, we, will, we will. We can go We can go deeper. So uh, I don't know when, but whenever, maybe in the future, we'll, we'll have, you, have you on again and we'll keep chipping away because I just want to, even if I can only reach one person my age, I think that's a victory. And that's, that's what I want to do. That's what I want to do. Okay. Absolutely. Hey, thank you. God bless you. And uh, keep up the good fight. Yes, ma'am. Take too. care. Yes, ma'am. Take care. Yes, ma'am. Bye-bye.